Welcome to the Startup Leader Show, where we learn lessons from startup founders and executives. I am your host, Lisa Dreher, and I'm really excited to introduce our guest for today, Jeff Dance. He is the CEO of Fresh Consulting. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks for having me, Lisa. Absolutely. It's so great to have you here. Thank you for making time for this. Maybe we can start by having you give a little bit of background on yourself and Fresh Consulting. Great. Yeah, I grew up in the Seattle area. That's uh, kind of where Fresh Fresh is as a headquarters. We have a few other offices, uh, locations, uh, Costa Rica, Thailand, um, Texas, Portland. Um, but Seattle is kind of our headquarters. Um, I've been here for a while, as I mentioned. Um, I started the company. I'm kind of the founder and CEO. I think we're coming up on 16 years, about 400 employees, a uh, team of strategists, designers, uh, engineers, both software and hardware. And uh, it's fun. Yeah. What an amazing, uh, amazing story, I am sure. So maybe we can get to that a little bit later. One of the things that we really wanted to learn about, well, actually, maybe you can give us a little bit of an overview, more of an overview of um, some of the work that Fresh Consulting does, and then we'll jump into the other topic. Yeah, yeah. Well, Fresh is unique in that, you know, some companies are like a design company, some are software, some are, you know, engineering. We actually have a, a multifaceted kind of end-to-end -end approach, and we try to combine those disciplines into teams. And then we work on, you know, innovative uh, work and we consider ourselves an innovation company, um, which there are not a lot of in the world um, that try to do, do that. And so you're kind of bridging a lot of complexity together to try to simplify it for a client or for a product. Um, so that's kind of our approach. Um, when it comes down to things that we actually design and build, we're often designing products like hardware products. Uh, robots, we do um, automation like uh, with robots and uh, software. We build uh, industrial autonomous vehicles. We actually build software, uh, even websites. Um, anything that kind of helps a company stay ahead or stay relevant. Um, that's been sort of our how we started the company, why we started the company with how fast technology was changing and why we're still here today. Wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> So one of the things that we really wanted to learn about today is the capabilities that you have in your RF lab. It sounds like you have an RF lab on site. It would be great to learn a little bit more about your capabilities. Yeah. So, and that's interesting. Um, you know, as you think about uh, anything that's connected today, um, there, every device, it seems like is connected and um, connected and becoming smarter essentially at the same time. Um, just with how technology has been advancing. And so uh, RF or radio frequency is like a, a part of being connected. And so things that have antennas um, that use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or radio or just have a cell connection, um, you know, all these smart devices that we uh, uh, live in or work with or carry with us um, have this aspect to them. And whether, and no matter where you go, whether you're in a hospital or you're, you know, outside or you're at work or you're in different settings, there's so many smart you know, smart connected things today that are talking to each other. And so that's where RF comes into play. We have an RF lab. And so that that's part of us having the breadth and depth to kind of be able to, to innovate. And that what that means is we have a lot of equipment to help design, simulate, kind of prototype and test antennas on devices um, and kind of do that whole end to end cycle in house. And so if we have a client who needs something really innovative, that's trying to do something uh, novel, or the next iteration of something, and we can kind of handle that all here. Wow, that sounds amazing. So what kind of um, capabilities and equipment do you actually have in the RF lab? Yeah, you know, going back to um, the kind of steps, I mentioned sort of design and simulate, prototype and test. Like if you weren't really familiar with RF, I would say like those are some of the core things where it's like, People don't really understand too much about, I would say uh, the layman's person doesn't understand too much about like antennas, but like all antennas, like the the power you put into antenna and then the power you get out need to be kind of analyzed. The the signals that you're sending over these waves, you need to make sure that you have uh, integrity of those signals. The, the, uh, um, the, the amount of power you're putting out. So like you don't fry someone's brain. Um, <laughs> and like it, you, we have this all around us, like all the time, we don't realize it. And it's all regulated by the FCC um, and uh, the, the, the uh, uh, federal communications commission. So 
actually making sure that all of that work complies is is important to making sure that everything is safe, um, yeah. safe and efficient. And so that is uh, that's kind of the core. That's the high level. You know, if I were to speak to an engineer, I would say, oh, yeah, we have a spec in, we have a VNA, we have a, a SIG gens, we have um, a power analyzer, we have an O-scope. Those are some of the more technical terms. Um, mm -hmm. But we have a lot of equipment around um, analyzing the, the signals uh, and designing these circuit boards. We can even print circuit boards ourselves in our lab and making sure that everything is uh, uh, working properly and efficient. That's great. So if I'm a founder and I have um, some sort of product idea that I want to develop, how would I go about potentially working with your team? You know, um, thank you. Um, you know, we work from the like napkin sketch all the way to like scaling of, Hey, I need, I need to build millions of these. And so we have like projects right now where we're like at the napkin sketch stage and we're all also at the, like the scaling of millions. And so if you are pushing out millions of product, you better be sure that then that antenna works properly, you know, um, that connected aspect of your product works properly. And so that's something where, you know, you, we can come in later in the cycle, but actually starting with people at the very beginning and thinking about the product design, knowing that uh, the aesthetic design, the UX design, if there is an aspect or the industrial design uh, and then the circuit design, um, the software or firmware and the antenna design. Um, that's where again, the RF, RF aspect comes into play. We can work with you at the very beginning. In some cases, we're, we're buying things that have already been FCC certified and you don't need to do uh, that work. In other cases, you're trying to truly do something um, that's more custom or more novel. Uh, if you're truly trying to do an innovative product, then typically there could be an innovative, um, uh, you know, there is that, that's, that uh, antenna design up front. So we work with people from the very beginning um, you know, if they have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, radio, cell, any sort of connection, then we can help them, uh, you know, end to end. That's great. That's great. So what are some of the most unique uh, products or solutions you've had the opportunity to work on? It, uh, it's really fascinating. Um, you know, I would say in the last few years, we've been doing, we've worked with like 100 clients a year. So we see lots of different things. Um, one of the fun things is, you know, the robotics projects, like we've been working on a, a unique um, way to do robotic surgery that would be um, really innovative, um, given uh, how a robotic surgery has been advancing. Um, we've worked with restaurant robotics recently. We've worked with a new type of robot arm that's um, really modular. Uh, we worked with a robot that does um, unique uh, camera kind of visual shots. Um, we're working on a on, on an autonomous vehicle right now that has a um, you know computer a computer vision aspect where often robotics can come into play as you think about what they're trying to get done. Um, you know, so lots of interesting robotics work uh, and automations work. Um, Recently, we've been doing a lot more medical product development as well. And I think that's really um, meaningful when you can like there's a, a life saving aspect to to the product where, um, you know, you can improve people's lives. And so that's that's really interesting, I think, for the team and meaningful. Um, you know, I mentioned industrial autonomous vehicles. We probably worked on like 10 different industrial autonomous vehicles. And so we haven't quite seen, you know, the uh consumer autonomous vehicles that are on the streets, but in, in these contained environments for the, in the, in the industrial environments, you know, things are going to continue to accelerate. And so that's been really interesting um, working on uh, autonomy and, and automation and, and how companies, um, you know, have connected vehicles that also need to be safe in these working environments. So those are some things that come to mind um, that have been uh, really interesting in the last, last couple of years. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like a lot of fun. When um, So when you look at kind of all of these advancements that are happening, and you've kind of alluded to a lot of these, what are some of the most significant changes you see coming from the wireless and like IoT areas? Sure. Uh, you know, I would say if we look back over the last 10 years, we kind of heard this word smart and like a lot of things were like smart because they were connected and they were connected to the internet. And that was like a new thing where like, Oh, the, I'm going to get, I'm going to, you know, know if someone shows up at my door, or I'm going to get a little signal from something like, you know, something that's connected um, to my, uh, my mobile phone, you know, mm -hmm. um, at work, we have different things that are connected and, and almost anything could be connected. 
And uh, they just needed to, you know, have one of these antennas that sent a little signal. And there's lots of different ways to send signal. There's a short form with Bluetooth. There's longer range with Wi-Fi. And then, you know, cell, cell phone and 3G, 4G, 5G, these different bands of communication. You can send long, longer signals. And we have all this connected stuff. And it's all, it's now like, a, a lot more things are continuing to be connected at a faster pace. Uh, but now that they're connected, there's this new uh, era of being smart. We said they were smart before, but they weren't really smart. Now that we have AI coming into the picture, the notion that something can be truly smart uh, and be more assistive uh, versus more input output or you know status, I think that's sort of the new era. And so, um, like we hear a lot about generative AI, but generative AI and robotics is a conference we put on. And, we, and, and it's really fascinating about what's happening with generative AI and robotics. I always think about robotics truly getting to the next level. And that's because they can be a lot smarter. Um, I would say the same thing for any device that is out there. It can be a lot smarter with advances of, an AI, of AI. Uh, if I'm talking to engineers here, here at, you know, fresh, like low level, um, I would say they're you know, also excited about Wi-Fi 7 and this, the certified chips that are coming out with um, MLO, which is multi-link operation. And that enables um, Wi-Fi to have more data um, pushed through it, better resiliency, lower latency. And all that really matters as we think about all this connected stuff that's trying to push more data, stuff like video. Oh, I'm trying to push video through these, through these, um, you know, uh, through these uh, waves or these bands. And, um, mm -hmm. And so Wi-Fi 7 is, um, you know, an important aspect of, of the wireless capabilities as you think about the IoT world. But the IoT world is going to continue to accelerate. And I think we're going to see, and that's why servers, you know, are, are, are an issue right now, not just for generative AI, but like um, the amount of, of connection that's happening, the amount of data that we're now sending and transmitting, it's just multiplying. Yeah. And, you know, technology kind of have a, has a life of its own and, and, we're just trying to keep up with it as humans, you know, like we, we, we don't change as fast as technology changes. And that's why, that's why fresh kind of exists is to try to help companies adapt and stay relevant and know like, okay, what do I need to do or not do? Um, what, what is, what is the bit, the best technology for today, given what I'm trying to accomplish? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of times what we talk about on the show is just kind of those success factors, what you're talking about, but more in general business. And so, you know, if, if you're speaking with another founder, what would you say is one of the biggest keys to your success so far? I think as a founder, I think, Part of it is adapting and scaling yourself and knowing like how you hire people that are smarter than you and then let go of the next thing. And I feel like I've, you know, I've been the one person sort of founder and then the two person, part of a two person team and then, and then five and then 10 and then 20, 50, a hundred, 200, 300, 400. And I, and I, I'm constantly evolving myself. And I think sometimes a lot of companies don't scale out of the founder willing to let go of certain things. And so I'm trying to time the right time to let go of something and, and hire the person that's going to do it better than me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think uh, learning to let go, I think is really important as you think about scaling. Um, I would say treating your company at the size that it is as well. Sometimes you, if you treat it a, a small company, like a big company, you can kill it. It's like, Oh, you put in too much infrastructure. You've hired too many people and you have too much, uh, burden there to adapt, to be able to adapt. And that, I would say that's one of the last things, you know, like, I think that no matter what, like planning is important, planning for the best case scenarios, planning for the, the worst case scenarios uh, is important. And, and knowing that you are going to have to adapt, you're going to have to have pivot and having sort of a growth mindset and know that like, oh, this, this could be good for me. Um, yeah. if, you if you truly want to um, succeed, there's a lot of, a lot of pivoting that, and adapting that happens, you know, through the years. Oh, indeed. So how do you decide when is, I guess, the right time to start scaling? I think that that's something kind of like what you're saying. The, sometimes companies can't really grow past that founder. How do you decide kind of when, um, when to do that scaling? What are some of the key criteria that you kind of look at? Yeah. I think on the front end, like everything flows from revenue in a sense from sales. And so like uh, if you are doing well from a sales perspective and then the, everything kind of trickles down from there a little bit. So if like you, if you're putting more stuff into the, the front, 
and things are growing, then to get to the next level, you actually have to constantly invest. And, and that's where you can't just think, leave everything else the same. Our, our kind of philosophy was like, let things get closer to a breaking point and then like be ready to kind of invest in the next person or the next technology and, um, and think about, you know, what, what do we need to do to scale? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so I, do, I hate to, I hate to use like breaking point, but hit, like when we started fresh, it was it, and for the you know, first five years, it was like, Oh, I, you were kind of getting to a breaking point and they're like, okay, now I need to, now I need to go. I, I can't sustain like this. I need to actually hire a project manager. Okay. Now that I got that project manager. I have that in place. I actually have to have our own dedicated sales team if I want that to kind of scale. Okay. Now that I have a dedicated sales team, Oh, I need like a, you know, a customer success person that can help handle, you know, the leading the customer side of things. Okay. Now that we have that, um, you know, how, how are we going to scale, you know, from a, from a geography perspective, um, that be, might be an example or from a technology perspective. Um, so I think it's, it's more like, I think it is solving sort of the, the revenue side and then knowing that you are going to keep investing and you're going to have the mindset of like changing um, versus like a specific, like one specific thing. But sometimes we put in too much infrastructure and we don't have like the sales to support it. And then like, you're just bleeding money if you're a startup. Um, so I think it's, you know, getting that right sort of, uh, revenue equation, knowing that customers are happy, seeing that demand, and then, you know, continuing to invest in the things that will help you scale. And for, I think for founders getting advice is important, joining like a cohort or a network. I've been part of Vistage for a long time, but there's lots of, uh, networks out there where you, you kind of share in the advice and problems that you're going through. You find out most everyone kind of has the same problems or same opportunities You learn a lot in the, in the process. Yeah, absolutely. It, so thinking back, knowing what you know now after, what did you say, 16, 17 years? Yeah. Looking back, if you were to start all over again, is there anything that you would do different? Hmm. I, uh, I think I would have given up some things quicker. And uh, one of the things that occurred to me like early on, and this would just be an analogy, like I had a really amazing salesperson come in that was helping uh, drive some sales and and I realized like, I'm not that magical. Like I thought I was like, I was like, oh, I'm the one who's selling everything and like driving everything. And like, we got to a certain point, like maybe we we're 30 people. And, and then I realized like, oh, like when he left, he was actually really successful. And when he left the company, I was like, oh, I need to build like a system here. Uh, and it doesn't need to all rely on me. And, and so I think going back, like I, you know, I would have taken, I took risks, um, but I would, I would have laid it. Um, I would have come in with the mindset of like, hiring uh, uh, some of these disciplines earlier on versus like finding out like, you know, I'm getting to my breaking point and then realizing like, oh, now I got it. Now I got to automate this. And so I think mm -hmm. taking those risks sometimes for people that are a little bit more control oriented are, are hard. And um, um, but that that's, you know, if I could go back, I would I would have done uh, I would have done some of those things sooner. And I think I spent like, I think six years working to like 2 a.m. straight or something like that. And so oh. um, there was a lot of sacrifice and kind of getting us to where we were. But then I realized, oh, you know, I just don't need to do it all myself. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I think we run into oftentimes is just roadblocks along the way. What have you found are the most effective ways to kind of work through those roadblocks that you've just inevitably run into? Mm-hmm. I've talked to, I mean, dozens of other CEOs over the last 10 years and, the, and some have had like, Oh, my, my company might die in like three months, you know? And, and so I've encountered a lot of this either at other companies or even our own where it's like, Oh, this is, this is a big issue. We're going through COVID or, Hey, this is a big issue. Like, you know, big tech companies, small tech companies aren't and like in the last couple of years, you know, aren't spending as much, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a little bit of a tech recession. So like navigating these obstacles, I think, um, I, I would say, you know, a, like having a team of people that you can talk to, that you can collaborate with, that you can plan with and thinking about options, I think is really important. Um, and I think once you get those options down on paper and you feel like you have a plan, you're in a position to make good decisions. Um, mm -hmm. and they say, if you have one option, you're a victim. If you have two, you have a dilemma. If you have three or more, you can kind of make a good choice. And yeah. so I think getting yourself into your like rational brain where you can like make a sound decision, strategize, think, get some advice from other parties. And then there's an element of like trusting your gut too. If, you, if you're a builder and you're an entrepreneur, you're an innovator. And it's like, you may get lots of different advice, 
Mm-hmm. And I, I've found over the years, I have to like seek my own inspiration and feel like, okay, this is what I feel is the right thing. And, um, and you know, and then I find out uh, year, years later or months later, you know, 60% of the time I'm right, 70% of the time, sometimes I'm wrong, but you learn and you've made a decision and that way you, you can move on because you've made a decision. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we get stalled in sort of paralysis and things happen to us, but we don't make those decisions. We don't come up with those options. We're not surrounded with with others that we're, as we're going through obstacles. And then that paralysis leads to some aspect of demise. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, that is some really good advice to end on. I want to thank you so much for being here today, Jeff. This was really great conversation and it was really terrific to learn about Fresh Consulting's RF Lab as well. So thank you for your time today. Thanks, Lisa. It was my pleasure. Absolutely. If somebody wanted to learn more about Fresh Consulting and or your RF Lab, what should they do? Definitely. We have information on our website. Um, They can call us like we have a whole team ready to chat about any needs that they have. Um, You know, they can reach out to me personally. It's Jeff at FreshConsulting.com. But love to hear more. Great, great. Well, thanks again for being here. And I do want to take just a moment to thank GuideForce for hosting these sessions. To learn more about GuideForce, you can visit GuideForce.com. And we'll see you next time on the Startup Leader Show.